Who surprised Ina Garden with a video for her birthday? Which country is eating the most chocolate? And how a woman running late with a frying pan in hand inspired an entire holiday? Today, we're here with everything you need to know. Welcome to the very first episode of Need to Know, where each week we're serving up all the hottest takes on the latest baking news, gossip, entertainment, and online trends fresh from the oven. I'm Mia Brabham, host, entertainment expert, and banana bread enthusiast. And since today is the very first episode of the show, our special guest is none other than the amazing chef Gemma Stafford, here to talk about this new show and the latest with Bigger Boulder Baking. Be sure to subscribe, rate five stars, and review wherever you listen to podcasts, or like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Now, grab some breakfast, bake as you listen, or pour yourself a cup of coffee or tea because we're here to tell you what you need to know. All right, everybody, here's what I have for you hot from the oven. Happy Valentine's Day. As a hopeless romantic myself, a chocolate lover, I'm a huge fan of the holiday, but I am nowhere near as obsessed with it as Jennifer Garner is with Ina Garten, aka Barefoot Contessa. Last week for Ina's birthday, movie star Jennifer Garner made her a video compilation of clips from her hashtag pretend cooking show where she mentions the cooking and baking star, which is a ton. Ina's birthday, her mama. It must happen to Ina all the time. Her nails are always perfect. Barefoot C, otherwise known as Ina G. You know how Ina always says that vanilla makes chocolate taste more like chocolate? That's for you, Barefoot. There is so much gold here. Uh, talking turkey, Jen praying to Ina and asking her how to make one egg, half of an egg, smashing garlic and talking at the same time, which is hard. I've tried. I think we all have. Not a good look. And you know, you know, fresh nails while baking, that's highly relatable. I'm curious what Gemma will have to say about this because her nails always look good. We all know that. But my biggest question in all this besides the cat stain in the kitchen is, does vanilla actually make chocolate taste more like chocolate? We'll definitely talk more about this because I am curious. Anyways, Jennifer Garner, thank you for this gem. Garner and Garten forever this Valentine's Day. Also, I'm circulating a petition to make sure that Ina Garten's birthday is a national holiday because we deserve that, don't we? Thank you. Next up, of course, we can't talk about Valentine's Day without talking about chocolate. Y'all. Chocolate sales have risen during COVID by 3.8%. According to a recent food study, Switzerland is the leading consumer of chocolate with its neighbors, Austria and Germany. With chocolate consumption growing year after year around the globe, these three countries, plus everybody else in the world, will not be happy to hear that Hershey is raising its prices at the end of the year. The Hershey company plans to introduce more zero sugar items and organic products during 2021. But the people want to know. How much will it cost? There is chocolatey good news in all of this, though. Ghirardelli is introducing new high cacao chocolate chips, a.k.a. products with even more chocolate in it. Pretty cool. It's safe to say I am that guy from SpongeBob SquarePants yelling chocolate down the streets. That is me outside right now. Yeah, go find me. I'm, I'm right over there. All right. Next up. Clubhouse. You haven't heard about it. Clubhouse is an invite-only audio-based social networking app that was just created in 2020 and is already valued at $1 billion. I I genuinely can't wrap my head around this. This went from, I think it was 1 million in 2020 to 1 billion in 2021. And it's a really cool platform. I used it myself. People use the platform to hold conversations, talks, workshops with friends and strangers, which is pretty awesome. And, you know, they just share what they know about the industry they're in. So naturally, a baking community is growing on the app. And we are going to talk about it with Gemma in just a little bit. Finally, looking ahead, February 16th next week is Pancake Tuesday, also known as Shrove Tuesday, Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras, you name it. And if you're anything like me, we're, and you're, you know, you're basically today years old when you found out what Pancake Tuesday is, please don't drag me internet. I'm trying my hardest. Uh, you probably already know that the traditional feast day is kind of the last hurrah before Lent. So basically, it's a reason to eat something delicious. So naturally, I'm all over it. According to the tale, in 1445, a woman out of Olney heard the shriving bell ringing while she was making pan- pancakes. So in a hurry, without thinking, she ran into church with her apron, still clutching her frying pan. It was a whole ordeal literally became a national holiday. And now pancake races happen all over the UK and the world and people just celebrate and it's a great time. I mean, someone wearing an apron and running out the door with a frying pan in hand. Is that not all of us? I mean, I'm late everywhere. So I mean, 
probably. So anyways, with all that being said, to get a real culinary take on what's going on, we need a culinary expert. We'll get to know some fun things about her later, but let's welcome right now the professional baker, host, cookbook author, and Bigger Boulder baking creator, Gemma Stafford. Hi, Gemma. Hi, Mia. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. How about you? It's good to I'm see you. Good. Yeah, good to see you too. Yes. Oh, it's bright and sunny everywhere. You're bright and sunny. I'm so excited, but okay. I, I just really need to know your hottest, juiciest takes on what's going on in baking. So we have quite a few things to talk about. First things first, I'm dying to know this. In the video clip, Jennifer says that Ina Garten says that vanilla makes chocolate taste more like chocolate. Is this true? I need your professional opinion. Please tell us. You know, that's that's a really good question. And um, I always talk about like seasonings when it comes to baking. So like salt is a seasoning, which is like not just for savory. You always think of it for something savory. Salt, uh, like a little bit of spice, something hot. Vanilla is always a seasoning. Uh, you'll know me by looking at my recipes that like I'm a huge advocate for salt and for vanilla. Yes. So <laughs> definitely it's like it enhances the flavor of the chocolate or anything that's added to. And it just brings out all those lovely notes and all the lovely flavors. So yeah, like I'm absolutely, I um, it's an astute observation. <laughs> Awesome. Good job, Jennifer Garner. You're learning Good something. Job, we love it. <laughs> Good job. We're rooting for you. But when we make when we become best friends, we'll have something to talk about. <laughs> yes. Maybe she'll make you a birthday video next. Next Aww. year since your birthday just passed. But that's true. Let me my people will get to her people. You know, it all works out in the end. It's okay. fine. Um, another thing that they talk about in the video that I think is just it's just so funny. Jen talks about her nails. Um, and she's like, I just did my nails, but I'm baking and it's very hard. And your nails always look good. So I'm wondering, is that is that also hard for you? Do you ever do with that. <laughs> you want to know something kind of funny? I, so I'm in Santa Monica. I, there's um, a few nail salons like on my street. It's like, like 90% of the shops are nail salons. Jennifer Gardner yeah. was uh, um, on my street one day going into a nail salon. So I wonder, did she get them done? I know it's a little shop down by my house. Kevin <gasps> and I were walking past one day and I was like, Kevin, Kevin, Jennifer Gardner. And um, he, he didn't see her, but she was standing right outside. So anyway, that's my, that's my, that's one of my Jennifer Gardner stories. Cause I actually yeah. saw her, I think like two or three times in real life, but I oh my gosh. <laughs> um, her nails, my nails, I, um, I do not go to a nail salon. It's not very Irish to go to a nail salon. Like, like when I grew up, my mom was always doing her nails at home. So on a Saturday night before they went out for dinner, she would always sit in the same chair and do her nails. And I just thought it was the fanciest thing because my mom was very fancy. Yeah. So um, I've just always done my own nails and I get a like $3 bottle of um, like this gel nail polish in Walgreens. And I just like, that's what I use. I oh never gosh. go to a nail salon. But you could tell, like, me, if you get up close and personal with my fingernails, you can tell, it's like, yeah, like, either a child did that or she was drunk. <laughs> That's funny because when I think of red nails, I think of Gemma Stafford. Okay, Aww. so back to the good stuff. Ghirardelli is now introducing a high cacao chocolate chip. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the average baker out there, um, what exactly does this mean? We can all guess it's more chocolate, but like, how is it going to taste? What's your insight into this? You know, I saw that. I'm like, I'm, I'm all about that. I love. I, I'm a lover of all chocolate. So like, for instance, I love white chocolate. And there's a lot of people who say white chocolate isn't chocolate and it technically isn't. And I get that. And we can ha that can be a conversation for another day. But um, I do love, um, I'm not the biggest fan of 100% cocoa. Um, solids, but I do love a really dark chocolate bar. You just have to know how to use it. It's like any mm. other ingredient. And I have um, a, a, a post on biggerbolderbaking.com about the different types of chocolate and where you should use them. So I think as long as you pair it right uh, with whatever recipe you're putting it in, um, you know, it'll work really well, but you just have to think like I use milk chocolate for like certain recipes. Like I pair milk chocolate with peanut butter all the time. I generally mm. don't do a dark chocolate with peanut butter, but I always do a dark chocolate when I'm doing something like chocolate and pears. So it just really depends on how you want to just be thoughtful about how you're going to use that like darker um, more bitter chocolate because it mm. will be bitter. So you're going to have to balance it with something sweet. Whew. 
All right, there we have it. <laughs> also, it's funny that you mentioned white chocolate because on Twitter the other day, people were fighting over what is the best chocolate. So we will definitely have to revisit this. Is it dark? Yeah. Is it milk? White? We'll, we'll circle back to that eventually. Yeah, on the show. for sure. It's an important topic. <laughs> it is very important. So also, I was just recently on Clubhouse watching one of your adventure doing. We talk about this as a new platform for all industries, but we're seeing a big, you know, boom in the baking community on this platform. So how have you seen it being used by bakers in the industry? How are you using it? Let us know. So I am new to Clubhouse. I am still figuring it out. Uh, I'm also still figuring out Snapchat and uh, I've just got my head around Instagram. So like, <laughs> mm-hmm. so I'll mm-hmm. get there, but I like it. I like how it is uh, other, you know, uh, industry folks um, talking, baking, talking food. I even like ended up in one uh, room the other day and it was um, talking, uh, these girls talking about going to Ireland, taking a trip to Ireland. And I really wanted to say something, but I didn't know how to like to raise my hand. So I had to ask Kevin. So I have to spend some time. I have to figure it out. But I really like it and I like the vibe and I like how it is inclusive. Yeah, and yeah, you learn, it's very and inclusive. It, yeah, and you learn a lot. And the best thing about Clubhouse is that you put it on while you're working or you're going for a walk. So it's just, I don't know, like you feel, you just feel like you've done something. That's very true. To better yourself. Me, yeah, yeah, right. It's very productive. It, <laughs> it gives me the feel of almost like a live podcast room, yeah. essentially. Like you're listening live and you can almost participate in the podcast, which is cool. So very excited to see more of those. Uh, so finally, I really want to know, you know, you're from Ireland. Um, you clearly bake dishes from all around the world. Pancake day is coming up. Oh. How do you specifically, because I know you have a lot of recipes on your website. How do you like to celebrate pancake day? And what is your favorite type of pancake to create? So Pancake Tuesday is coming up and growing up in Ireland, that was, it was a big deal. Like everybody would go to school and like uh, for your dinner that night, like everyone would be talking about like getting pancakes and your mom always made pancakes. So um, it's a, a tradition that I, I know it's, oh, it's awesome. It's a tradition that I hope to do with George. Um, I will because I, just, I don't know. I just loved it. It's uh, for those of uh, you who don't know, uh, Pancake Tuesday is also Fat Tuesday. Isn't that right, Mia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So you kind of pick out a little bit and then the next day is Lent. Yeah. Um, Something like, okay, uh, I'm going to circle back to that. But um, the... (laughs) If you think that right... I don't know. I uh, I remember my mom used to always make, so she used to always make pancakes. The thing about pancakes, let me tell you, Mia, is that in Ireland, we never had these gorgeous, thick, fluffy buttermilk pancakes that you have in the United States, which I adore. We, our pancakes mm-hmm. were crepes. They, we, they were <sighs> called pancakes because we didn't have uh, American style pancakes. Yeah. So my mom, like a crepe batter is so easy to make. And my mom, there's five kids, Mia, in my family. So we would all line up in the kitchen and my mom would just fry off crepes and you would get one. She would do simply lemon juice and uh, sugar. I talk about this in my cookbook because I have the recipe in my cookbook. And uh, you'd go eat your pancake, line back up again and get another pancake until the batter was all gone. And like, I just... It's one of the, probably one of the most fondest memories I have growing up and like, oh. because I was so young and I remember like the flavor, the taste, how, how the simplicity of it and just yeah. the kind of like, just the warm, the warm feels around that day. Oh, that's so lovely. I wonder if she, uh, ever, uh, the whole story of pancake Tuesday, par- apparently is that in 1445, the woman who was making pancakes ran to church late with the frying pan and her hand. No I wonder if your way. mom's ever done that. She's she has ever has she ever been anywhere just late, just like with the fine pan in her hand, just like <laughs> probably not. Yeah, She's great. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day. Who knows? Um, so you know, last, what's new with you? Just in your life, in you know, going on with bigger, bolder baking. Is there anything fun happening? That's a good question. We are getting ready so we're going to start filming um summer content really soon like we're we're almost filmed up to late spring so we're going to be like heading into the throes of summer so we're going to be start working on that um my culinary uh, superhero Ami who I work with who helps me with our recipes and on our shoots I've been working very hard with her Ami and I are working on something um that's kind of a sneaky secret that um I'll be working on over the next few months and I'll, I'll let you know more 
more about that. But we are, it's kind of all hands on deck, uh, Mia. We are cranking mm. out recipes. We're hoping to be producing recipes, uh, you know, almost every, new recipes almost every day of the week. We did it uh, before Christmas and we're hoping to mm. do it again. And um, yeah, we have this awesome, amazing Need to Know podcast. We're adding to the Bigger Boulder Baking family. And, uh, yeah, it's all, it's all really exciting. So you want to keep an eye on, uh, my website, on social media, because there's a lot of, a lot of things going on. Oh my gosh. I can't wait. And George's birthday is coming up too, George's right? <laughs> He's turning one next Tuesday. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, unbelievable. They grow up like, so fast. I know. <laughs> it's so funny because. Um, everybody has seen him now since he was like a few days old and now he's a year old. And like, when you think about like how long has the pandemic been going on? It's like, I have a one year old. Mm. That's how long it's been going on. Oh my gosh. Wow. (laughs) The true tracker of time. Well, I can't wait to talk more about George, about you. We're going to have such a great conversation after this, but for now, we're going to take a break. Stay tuned. Thanks Mia. All right, everybody, pull up your seats to At The Counter, a segment where we have a conversation with people who are doing interesting and amazing things in baking. Of course, today we have Gemma Stafford. She's an Irish-born chef, best-selling cookbook author, and the host of the hit online baking show, Bigger Boulder Baking. Gemma helps anyone bake with confidence anytime. Yes, talking about me. I am that person. I am that fan. Anywhere with her chef-tested recipes and techniques that take the fear out of baking. Her videos have been viewed more than 350 million times, and she has more than 8 million fans, aka Bold Bakers, all of you, online. She's been featured on numerous TV shows and as a guest judge on the Food Network's Best Baker in America, as well as Nailed It on Netflix. Every day, Gemma connects with her millions of fans online via YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and her website, www.biggerbolderbaking. Please welcome, even though we kind of already talked to her, Gemma <laughs> Stafford. <laughs> Woo! I wish what I had a lovely compliment. introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a lovely person, so it helps. That, oh. I mean, that was the easiest intro ever. Oh my gosh, Gemma. <laughs> I have to start with something. You're, you're going to be like, how did you know this? Please tell us about your experience with Usborne Cookbooks. Oh, Osborne cookbooks. How did you know that? <laughs> a little birdie. Maybe a uh, few of them. I don't know. <laughs> um, Osborne cookbooks. Is that a thing in the in the US? So I was looking it up and you can yeah. actually get it here. Yeah, but of can. course, it's it's you can tell that it's not like it's not from the actual US. You have to pay yeah. I think, in pounds or something or there, at least convert um, it. Oh my gosh. So growing up, we had these lovely little books called uh, Osborne, o- Osborne books. And we had a, a cookbook and then there was um, like a storybook and they, they do different types of books. The, the cookbook, um, we, I just adored. I'll get to that in a second. But the thing about the Osborne books is that, so there were these little characters of people, little characteristics of people. And there was a woman and there was a man and they were like chefs and uh, or they were just like little people. But in the book, on every page, there was a little duck. And ducks were a big part of this like Osborne world. And you had to find the duck hidden on every page. And like, I just, I remember so vividly, like being in the house that I grew up in, in Ireland, like reading the books. I can, I can see them right in front of me now. But I, I really, I always gravitate towards recipes, books, anything that is, um, oh gosh, that is drawn, you know, that is yeah. like, especially if it's a little bit kind of animated and uh, I just adore them. They made a cookbook that we had that my mom got us and it was all um, animated recipes. So there was very little writing. It was all just kind of like little mm-hmm. pictures of a pot and a spoon and like chopping up fruit. And it was just like so sweet. I actually have it here in the US with me in my house <gasps> in Santa Monica. And um, they're super sweet. And they're like the the little people are same little people in the cookbook. And they're like, they're little people and there's a huge big bowl and they're like whipping up uh, the batter. And then there is like the little duck hidden still like on the pages. Oh my God. I have like that talk about like memories, like that transports me like right back there. I think 
The books are French mm. and um, very popular in Europe. And I think they, I, I think I think they're st- they're still in print. But I don't know if they're making new books. But I know they're still mm-hmm. in print. And I just I got Georgie one, which is um, <gasps> Irish, which is oh, I'm trying to think of. It's, I think it's your first words in Irish. So oh, George wow. and I go through the. Um, they have like you know, all the basic words in Irish and we go through the book. He actually loves it. He always opens it up on the same page. It's funny. Oh my gosh. I love that. Is there um, one recipe that stands out in your memory at all from it's the so cookbook? It's crazy because they were such simple recipes and we were kids. So yeah. it was like a fruit salad, you know, <laughs> and like chop up an orange, chop up an apple, you know, it's wow. kind of like fruit salad. Yeah, just put a whole pile of fruit in a bowl. But like when you're a kid, you're like, okay, I'm going to make fruit salad. So I need an orange. I have to get this type of apple. I need all of these things. And it's all very serious, you know, but like there was things like yeah. fruit salad, Welsh rarebit, which I don't know me if you ever had a Welsh rarebit. It is no, like I a need toasted sandwich. With um, mustard and I'm trying to think of what else. Just like to very, very simple recipes. Uh, but yeah. just like the book was just like beautiful. Like at all the colors and everything. Yeah. This makes a lot of sense because I feel like a lot of, you know, what you do for so many of your fans and your your readers, your listeners is you make baking easy. And it sounds like this book just gave you the agency and kind of that confidence, which, which is exactly what you do for kids to just be like, yeah, I'm making a fruit salad and I know the right type of apple because it's right here and the right type of orange. So yeah. it's really cool. It kind of, you know, I feel it like connects to a lot of who you are today, which is yeah. awesome. Speaking of, why are we here? We're doing a podcast right now. This is wild. So tell us, you know, more about why you wanted to start this with Bigger Boulder Baking. So we're, we're this is a whole new world for us, Mia. Like, it's crazy. And you're here, like, along for the ride. And you're doing awesome, by the way. Thank you. I'm, like, pinching myself. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... You know, Bigger Boulder Baking uh, is not just, you know, YouTube videos. It is, it's a website. It's a set, like you said, it's uh, 8 million fans all around the world. And we, and I'm only one person and I can only bring you so many recipes. And we want to be like releasing recipes every day. We want to bring more uh, more creators on board. We want to bring you um, different recipes, different cultures, a, t- a taste from different parts of the world. And uh, so you'll be seeing a lot more of, um, well, you'll be seeing more of me, but um, a lot more of, we're going to expand our community. And then the podcast, of course, is, this is still video, but the podcast is, it's another, another realm that we can be involved in and talk food and talk about like, whatever, like what's going on, food memories, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what's going on in Bigger Bulger Baking, but it's just, it's, it's, you know, for when you're out and about, you're in your car, you're going for a walk with your dog, or uh, you're baking in the house and you have something to listen to. So, so pretty much Mia, we're everywhere. So anywhere All you turn, places. eventually we will be there. <laughs> I love that. Expansion. Yes. We need a song for that. Um, so do you have, I mean, besides Jennifer Garner, do you have any dream guests for the show? Oh my gosh. Um, do I just start saying people's names and then <laughs> Kevin will go get these people? <laughs> yes. Reese Witherspoon. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> Brad Pitt. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I have some friends. <laughs> Pretty sure he's not a big baker. Um, oh my gosh. But I have I have a lot of friends uh, who are going to have lined up to come on. And I've spoken on their podcasts and I, I'll, I'll keep those a secret for right now. But yeah, we're hoping that, um, you know, anybody who um, has an interest in baking and food will like are more than welcome to come on and chat with us. And if they're a celebrity, then all the better. Yes. I'm so <laughs> excited to see all your friends and guests who come on the show. Um, and you know, one thing we really want to do with this segment is have a conversation, like just chat. It's called at the counter because we like that feeling of being in the kitchen and just really just building camaraderie and a bond with someone. So, you know, so much of bakers and chefs lives start in the kitchen somewhere. So what is the first thing you ever remember baking? If you can even remember it. <laughs> I can. It was a long time ago, but I do. I remember um, in Ireland as a kid, um, 
any Irish person listening to this will know that like you start making, you know, there's always a one recipe you make as a kid. I don't know what that mm. is here. Like I think Kevin told me he used to make like peanut butter cookies, I think. Um, but with us, we always made like cupcakes. So like little buns, mm. a really simple recipe. It was just like plain vanilla cake and you would always just make these buns. And I used to make them night after night. And like that was the first Thing. I remember kind of baking myself, but I remember being in the kitchen and helping my mom and like helping her make meringues, making, um, she, maybe, maybe I, I, mm, it kind of goes between buns and apple crumble. I, I have, uh, my mom used to make apple crumble and she used to allow us to do the crumble part because, you know, oh, we had like such little fun. hands. Yeah. Um, but that, I, that's one of my earliest food memories. Wow. Um, and prob- probably the actually apple crumble was one of the first things I ever made and I made that wow. with my mom but she used to like I remember and this go I, I said this already but we don't live in the house well um my grandparents don't live in the house that I grew up in anymore but like it was such a lovely house that I grew up in and I remember standing at that kitchen table being like so high and my mom peeling and chopping apples and in Ireland you have these apples. My mouth is watering just thinking about it because they're very sour. <laughs> and they're called Bramley apples. Mm. And you have to, it's kind of weird because they're thinking of why would you use them for baking? They're amazing for baking because they they get really soft, almost like a puree. Like they're really fantastic, but they're as sour as bedamned. So you need to dust them in a lot of sugar. So my mom used to dust them in sugar, leave them in the bowl and then like I would help with the topping or whatever. But I remember we were always allowed mm-hmm. to take an apple out of the bowl and it would be coated in sugar because if it wasn't like, honestly, you wouldn't be able to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we use to make our apple crumbles. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. You know, you just also transported me back um, to when I was in seventh grade, speaking of crumbles. And I think I made a fake baking show on YouTube. Literally nobody go find it. But I did the same thing and I was obsessed with s'mores. And so I did crumble. I did the cram- graham crackers in a sandwich yeah. bag and I crushed them and I made it for this stupid little cooking show. But I mean, like it, it's something about crumbles, I guess when you're growing up, it's like, that's what we all, it's a good starting point. They should put that it in Osborne. Is. <laughs> it is. It's just like, it's an easy way just to get like kids involved and stuff like that. Yeah. It's a very, very fun way. So speaking of kids, you know, you, George, Kevin, you just were back in Ireland over the holidays. Um, tell us, you know, not just, you know, we know you're from Ireland, but tell us more stories about, you know, just the quality of food in Ireland and the great food you had, you know, growing up as you got older um, and also working for priest. That's cool. So uh, tell us more. I just want to know everything. Um, okay. Well, you know, I think it's funny, like it's like 2021 right now and a lot has changed even when, from when I went to college and growing up in Ireland, like I've seen the food scene come a very long way. And um, it's interesting because I don't know, Mia, like if you have like what, what springs to mind when you think of Irish food but we're not, we were never thought of as like the finest cuisine. Like a lot of it was mm. thought of meat and potatoes. And you know what? Mm. A lot of it is meat and potatoes. Like that's true. Um, but I'm going to tell you now that like, it might be some of the best meat and potatoes that you ever had. One mm. thing that we have at our disposal that we're really fortunate uh, to have is that we're on a small island. We're an island um, of, gosh, I think I think it's uh, less than 5 million people now. And wow. we... Uh, we have really amazing produce and a lot of our food is farm to table because the island mm. is so freaking small that yeah. like it's your your food is only traveling so far. So um, we're fortunate uh, to have amazing produce, f- uh, fish, like we're on an island, um, farm, like thinking about like cows grazing on green grass every day because it does nothing but rain and rain and rain. So there's constantly green grass, which is great for your meat, which is great for your butter. It's great for all your dairy. You know, it's just, we were really fortunate to have that. And I go, when I go home, I notice that difference that we Mm. have some of the best produce. And what I love about, um, like, you know, today is that like, you can get, like, I get emails from people in Africa saying I I can get Kerrygold in my local shop or they can get Dublin or Irish cheddar, you know, like I am, uh, like 
I definitely save Irish butter because it's a little bit more expensive over here for like mm-hmm. for like my toast and like for nice for <sighs> making nice things. But you know, if you have the ability to like have these products, like I, I absolutely recommend them. But um, saying that, like we were we were for a very long time known for, uh, like I said, meat and potatoes. But now, like it's twenty twenty one. And we have been through a lot. We have, uh, you know, as mo- most recent as when there was a recession in 2008, a lot of people left Ireland. They left to find work. They left to make money. They, um, they had to leave their families, friends behind, move to Australia, move to Asia, uh, New Zealand. And um, that was 12 years ago now, 13 years ago, and they came back and they they bought these new cultures with them. They came back mm-hmm. with new families. They came back with new traditions. They came back with new flavors and tastes. And that has today really kind of, um, has, what's the word, um, kind of taken Irish food in another direction, which is, which is yeah. fantastic because, you know, like the more diversity, the better. That's awesome. And I will say I had someone over for dinner once and they told me, they're like, why do you use that butter? And I was like, I don't know. I just grew up using it. And they're like, you need to use Kerrygold from now on. And I was like, yes, sir. And I yeah. genuinely haven't gone back. It's the best butter. So it's the best. And you know Absolutely. what else? It's, um, I don't know, like it's, it's the same price. If I if I go to Costco and get myself a big old pack of Kerrygold, it's mm-hmm. the same price as the butter, as some of the not so great butter I find in my supermarket mm. here. So it's kind of like why not? Like why am I'm not going to yeah. pay the same money for like a, like um a uh, inferior product? <laughs> yes. Listen, life That's is I, short. Li- buy Kerrygold. Okay. Life is too short to be to be eating crappy butter. Like let's just face it. Yeah. Life is short. Butter is good. The end. Period. Yeah. That's all the people need to know. So there we have it. And salted, Mia, always salted butter. <laughs> and salt, salted butter. Okay, that yeah. is good to know because I sometimes will see in a recipe like unsalted and I'm like, but do I really want that? Do I really? I'm like, yeah, I'm insulted. It's a choice. Like I get emails all the time. Like, uh, do I, do, is this, like you don't say in the recipe, is it salted or unsalted? Mm-hmm. It really comes down to your preference. There's a lot of, this is going off on a tangent a little bit. Um, A lot of times, because I think, the salt content in butter isn't always regulated here. So it can really vary and you could end up with a very salty butter. But I just go for it. I use salted butter and I use salt and I just, uh, you know, fly by the seat of my my pants. And it always works out. Yes. Oh my gosh. You make it work. Uh, Speaking of making it work, one thing I do want to ask, which is like random going back, but need to know, why this name for the show? Do you have like, do you love kneading? I know it's a play on the word. Clearly these are things people need to know, but how do you feel about the title? (laughs) So it's really funny. Um, In a previous life, when I lived in San Francisco, when I first came to the US, um, it was, let me see, it was 2009. And I was, I don't know, I was like mid, late twenties. And somebody bought me to, uh, brought me to a, dinner pop-up when pop-ups are just kind of they weren't even a thing yet they were just like starting and um and I think that was also actually um uh after the recession as well and somebody brought me to this pop-up and it was an amazing like five-star dinner in like somebody's house in San Francisco there was a few of us around the table the food was incredible we bought our own wine like it was a blast. And I thought to myself, how do I get involved in this? Like, how do I, I, I want to be a part of this. And I was working at a mission restaurant at the, oh no, was I? I think I had my catering business at the time mm-hmm. and I wanted to do a pop-up and I, I adore bread. It's what I, quite, I, I don't do fine dining. I worked in fine dining for many years, never it's not my favorite cuisine to eat. It's n- never been my favorite thing to make. Um, to it's never been my favorite uh, kitchen to work in, but um, I adore pizza. I adore bread. I adore 
everything to do with yeast. So I said, if I was going to do a pop-up, like it would have to be something in my specialty. So I did a bread pop-up and I called it Need to Know. And out of my house in San Francisco, um, I got the word out with my friends and people I worked with, people I used to work with, um, friends of friends of friends, opened up my the house, uh, the door to my house in San Francisco, which probably isn't advisable, like to <laughs> every Tom, Dick and Harvey out on the street. And I just started making pizzas and until wow. people stopped coming. And I called it need to know because it was, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was, kind of like by invite only. So if it was, mm-hmm. you know, it was, uh, I advertised it through friends, through colleagues, everything like that. But yeah, I called it Need to Know and it was it was so much fun. It was a lot of work, but wow. it was great fun. And yeah, I did it. I did it a few times and it was like really, it was great. It was so much fun. And we had a, like um, I had, I, I enlisted friends um, to help me like, to crank out pizzas. We were just in the kitchen, like topping pizzas wow. into the oven. The oven, like this really crappy gas oven that we had in our kitchen that cranked up to 500. And we were just churning out pizzas and give it and pouring two buck chuck. And, um, we oh, had a pot, we had a, like an empty vase and, you know, it was kind of the honor system. People just put money in the vase, uh, for pizza and. <laughs> That's it was incredible. it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was awesome. I never knew that. This is how we're here. I love that. That's that's really cool. Um so, you know, it, within that story you kind of mentioned you were like, was I working at this place at this point? Was I doing this? So I mean, you've worked in a lot of kitchens. Like, you know your stuff. So, tell us between, you know, being a line chef for a ski resort in Australia, to, you know, like a private chef for a family in Italy, I think, and then a pastry chef working in a hotel and spa in Ireland and California and San Francisco. What are some horror stories? What are some of your favorite memories? Um, Like, just tell us one if you can even think of it. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Horror stories. Yeah, I've got plenty of those. (laughs) Um, Horror stories. I'll tell you uh, one story. When I was when I first moved to the US, I came over here to work, that was 2005, to work at a, um, to work in a casino in South Lake Tahoe. So I was coming over here. I didn't know where South Lake Tahoe was. I really wanted to go to New York. I ended up in California, but Mm -hmm. I was so determined and gung-ho to come to the United States that I just, I took the job that I could get. I knew working for a casino group was maybe not the most glamorous job I ever could have, but, mm-hmm. um, but I, I was, I was determined. So I went for it, but I used to, so I was a bread baker in Lake Tahoe. I used to work, my shift started around three o'clock in the morning and I was 25 years of age and I was in pretty much a party town. It's South Lake Tahoe. So there's a lot of casinos, a lot of nightclubs, a lot of parties, oh a lot of young people. You're skiing <sighs> and snowboarding during the day. You're partying during the night. And I did all those things and I worked at 3 a.m. So I would snowboard. I would, you know, get ready to go out with my friends. I would be in, you know, socializing at Mm -hmm. one or two in the morning. (laughs) And then I would go into work at three o'clock in the morning. Iconic. um, I I did it for a year and I must, I think I aged myself greatly because after, yeah, after, I think that was sort of the end of my party days. I was like, I can't do this anymore. (laughs) It was, it was, it was like hot and heavy. It was intense, but it was fun. It was a lot of fun. But working at 3 a.m. is, it took my body a whole year to get used to working at that time. It was just a Mm -hmm. shock. Every morning was a shock to the system. That and some mornings I would have to be in at one. So it wasn't even the morning yet. And I was like in the bakery at one o'clock in the morning. So it was like, it was really intense. It must have taken, uh, how long did it take for your body to even get used to? A year, it took my body a whole year. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And that's what like, that's what I was only there for a year. (laughs) Oh my God. You're like, ah, it's okay. You're standing here today, which is great. Um, Speaking of what are, do you have any plans for Valentine's Day with the family? Um, Do you have special traditions and do you bake certain things at home? 
Um, you know, we don't really have any like big traditions around Valentine's Day except for like cards. We do like we do dinner. Like I usually make Kevin like what he likes for dinner, which luckily is also what I like. So it's kind of a two for one. <laughs> it's good. Um, but we like always make like nice dessert and um, yeah, we always try and go to do something during the day. Like we go out for a drive. Now we have Georgie. So we're probably going to do that. I'd say we'll do that. Like it's kind of food, family, nice, like chill day. Maybe a nice. movie or something. If you have any movie recommendations. Oh my gosh. I have a list. I love movies. <laughs> if you didn't know that. So I will definitely be sending it your way. That's very fun. I love it. So um, before we get into our speed round, I do have to know, it's one very serious question, Gemma, for you. In your blooper video for 2020, you said, which cracked me up, you were like, I've been doing stretches so my arms get longer. <laughs> and I need to know, are they working? Because I'm not kidding, Gemma. I cannot reach the top cabinet in my apartment. So you got to send me these stretches. Did I really say that? <laughs> you did. It was hilarious. Mia, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I cannot be held responsible for the things that I say. Okay. I just don't oh think that's God. fair. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I do these stretches every day. Um, I, it's I, it's so random. So I'm not a sometimes I'm not a morning person. It takes me a while to get going in the morning, and I and I mm. need to exercise. But I'm also quite lazy in the morning. So I do these stretches on the ground while I'm drinking my coffee in my jammies, and a lot of them are like stretching out and like holding kind of Pilates poses. This sounds very fancy. It's, it's just it's, it's like kind of random stuff that I think are working as exercises. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think it's it's definitely improved my posture because I'm oh, that's good. a lot of people don't know this, but like I am almost six feet tall. I'm just under six oh, feet. Oh wow. So like my posture is not great. I'm hunched over a computer. So it actually really mm -hmm. does help me with my posture. And then also carrying now um a little hefty baby around on one hip. So yeah, it does help. I would say try it. I would. Don't Thank do you. the like hanging from a doorway situation. Okay. But just try it, like out <laughs> your legs and your arms. Perfect. All right. I'm going into the year like this. Let's do it. Okay. So Gemma what's Stafford. The, yeah. So what's the lightning round? It's time for I'm the excited. speed round. Speed Let's round. do this. So I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you any of these questions. We're okay. going to just bulldoze through them and you have to okay. answer first thing you think of. Okay. Yeah. Ready? Let's start the Let's clock. Go first. Three, two. All right. Your favorite baking utensil. Oh, spatula. <laughs> your favorite childhood treat. Chocolate treat? Any treat, childhood treat. Oh, Can childhood chocolate. treat. Um, French toast. Favorite late night snack. Ice cream. Favorite baking show. Oh, I'm gonna say Ina, just cause I want her on my podcast. <laughs> oh my gosh, you, Jennifer. Jen, Ina, imagine. This We've is the magic friends. trio, we love it. Yeah, yeah. All right, your favorite person to bake for. I would say Kevin. He, he's a great. He's a great customer. I always, I always know. I always, luckily uh, he always enjoys what I make. That's good, Kevin. If you can hear this, I hope you're putting money in the vase at the front of the need to know door. Just so you know, <laughs> all the same pot, but it doesn't matter. And yeah. your least cash favorite only, no personal check. Cash only, cash only. <laughs> least favorite baking question. Oh, you know, I I think it. Oh my gosh, I, I think it might be what's my favorite thing to bake because I love it, because I love everything. I do, I love everything. There's nothing I don't eat. There's like, I just, I, I'm a lover of all foods uh, because I also, um, when we were young, like I just, I was always thought that like every, like food isn't bad, you know what I mean? There's people out there who have absolutely no food. So like, I always just like, I want to be inclusive and say like, there's nothing, I, there's really nothing I don't love. Oh my gosh, I love that. And that's the thing about food and baking, you know, speaking of Valentine's Day, it's just like, food is genuinely universal love language. It joins us all yeah. together. It's like music, right? Like you give it to comfort someone, you know, when someone just has a baby, you bring them over food. When someone passes, you bring them food. And I just, I love baking. I love cooking. Like I love that we can do this here and that we can talk about this. So thank yeah. you, Gemma, for coming on the first episode of Need to Know. How amazing. Where can we find you? Where can everybody find you? <laughs> uh, BiggerBolderBaking.com and Gemma underscore Stafford on Instagram. Gemma Stafford, Bigger Bolder Baking on uh, all social media. 
Awesome. And you guys can find me on Instagram at yours truly Mia on Twitter at hot mess Mia. If you're looking for a good time, I give a lot of hot takes there. Um, and we're just starting out. So before you head out, be sure to subscribe, rate the podcast, five stars, wherever you listen and leave a comment. Let us know what you want to see next week. Are you keeping up on the trends? We can talk about it here. So excited. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you next time on need to know. Bye. Thanks Mia. Bye. Bye.